All right, so yeah, tonight we'll try to review together why we want to do personalized treatment in hemophilia, why is this important? Uh, and well, the short answer is that because we want to offer the best possible care for hemophilia patients. And I hope that by the end of the presentation, we will understand why we can just give it the same dose to everyone uh, as we do, for example, for blood pressure medication or uh, aspirin that we just give one dose and it's good for everybody. So I just want to go through this first slides very quickly because you know that very well. Um, hemophilia A and B are um, bleeding disorders are similar. They uh, are uh, due to uh, mutations in the genes that codes for factor eight or factor nine have an X-linked pattern of inheritance, um, but they are not exactly the same. Um, this slide is just to show a few similarities and differences. Hemophilia A is much more common and we'll focus on hemophilia A only tonight. They have similar clinical phenotype, but factor eight and factor nine are quite different. So what we're going to say tonight about pharmacokinetic and factor eight is not exactly the same for uh, hemophilia B. This would take uh, much longer and a completely uh, different uh, presentation. Here, I just wanted to show you that factor eight is quite different from factor nine, and many of the characteristic of factor eight that explain why we can uh, tailor prophylaxis and how do we do that are uh, due be, uh, to this specific characteristics of factor eight. So, you know very well that um, hemophilia is uh, classified by its severity and severe patients ha that have a residual amount uh, of factor eight activity below 1% are those that have most often spontaneous bleeding into joints and muscle and more, more frequently and who benefits from prophylaxis. Why do we want to do prophylaxis? Well, uh, there's a number of studies that show how important is prophylaxis in hemophilia, but I just want to cite this one. Uh, to start is a, uh, a clinical trial was published in 2007 that enrolled uh, boys, um, young boys, and uh, that were uh, randomized to primary prophylaxis or episodic therapy. And this uh, this young uh, hemophilia patients were followed and assessed at uh, age six. And as you can see in this slide, about half of them that were treated only on, on demand had normal joints and bled quite frequently compared to those that uh, have started prophylaxis early that had mostly normal joint and bled much less. So prophylaxis with factor eight can prevent the joint damage and decrease the frequency of joint and in general bleedings in, uh, in hemophilia patients. Now, there have been a lot of improvement in the hemophilia care that you can see, some of them are uh, reported here. And among the last few uh, improvements, I mean, beyond the increasing safety and efficacy of factor concentrate, um, and in the engineering of the factors, uh, the new generations of factors, I think we also have uh, the the tools that allow us to have uh, the, the pharmacokinetic of our patients readily available and that we can use that information to tailor the prophylaxis on, on hemophilia A, A patients. Our objectives, of course, have to uh, prevent bleeding and control the bleeding when it happens, avoid any possible joint damage because it's irreversible and we don't want any permanent damage in any joint, and in the end, we want to achieve uh, an optimal quality of life. We want that our patient can have the job that they want, the relationship that they want, that they can do the sport that they like to do. This is our ultimate goal. So we can individualize the therapy taking into account many uh, variables, the age, the body weight, how active is the patient, if there's a history of inhibitor, if there's arthropathy, what is the desire of the patient? Increase, decrease the, the, the infusion, have a higher uh, factor level because he's doing you know, a high uh, physical activity, very uh, demanding physical activity very often. Um, and all these aspects can be taken into account using 
a, a pharmacokinetic uh, assessment. Now, in this graph, you see uh, how the number of joint bleeds correlates to the basal, the baseline factor eight uh, activity. And as you can see uh, in this uh, in this uh, representation, uh, this is a paper published in 2011, we have a dramatic reduction of uh, the number of joint bleeds when uh, the baseline factor eight activity, the trough level is uh, below, uh, is above, sorry, 1%, and in particular when is above 3%, with nearly uh, zero uh, joint bleeds when is uh, above 12%. How can we achieve this trough level? Well, we have to inject the factor concentrates. Uh, and as you know, they have a short half-life. They last uh, not for long in our body. They get uh, cleared very quickly. Uh, and in particular, factor eight has a much shorter half-life. Um, for factor nine and factor nine new extended half-life product, the story is a bit different because uh, now we have products that have a very long half-life that, uh, that uh, allow for uh, very long intervals between one infusion and the other. But unfortunately, for factor eight, this is not the case yet. And now I want to briefly discuss why uh, what can't we give the same dose to everybody. If you take a look at the average of the half-life of the product that are currently on the market, these are probably are mostly available, you can see that we have something between 11 and 19, depending on if you look at the package insert or at, uh, data published from um, real world uh, type of um, research or uh, clinical trials. Um, and but what it's really important to to notice is that this bar that represent the range where you can have your health life in the in the different patients is extremely wide, so you can have an extreme variability among uh, patients. Why is this important? This this graph is just uh, an example to to understand this this concept. So uh, here you have uh, in this axis, you have the concentration, and here on the x-axis, you have different subjects. And let's say that we measure the concentration of one medication in the different subjects twice, okay? If the first measurement from the second one is so different within the same subject, you can have the concentration that go outside the therapeutic window. So the only thing that you can do is to constantly monitor what's happening. And this is the case, for example, for uh, of drugs that have a very narrow uh, therapeutic windows and can be dangerous, such as warfarin. Then you can have other drugs that if you give it to different patients and you measure the concentration that you achieve in the different, uh, in the different patients, they always stay within the therapeutic window. So you don't need to monitor anything. You can just give a fixed dose. But the case of the clotting factor concentrate is more like this. If you repeat two measurements in the same individual, you will have similar concentrations, but there is a lot of variability between subject seven and subject eight, subject eight and subject nine. So you can use uh, a pharmacal uh, kinetic guided um, dosage. So how can we manage the variability? Here I want to show you uh, a standard uh, half-life uh, product. The red uh, area, actually our red bars, represent individual half-life of the same product in different people. Look how different can be from six hours here to almost 20, 22 hours. And the blue bar is the time to 2%. Of course, it's correlated to the half-life, but see how different it is. In some patients can go up to 100 hours. In others, it's just 30, 35. So there's an extreme variability with the standard uh, half-life product. And the source of variability is mostly uh, the each uh, linked to each individual characteristics. Is it the same for the extended half-life? I want to quickly cite this um, 
research paper from Dr. Carcao uh, from the University of Toronto here that compared two concentrates, eloctate and adenovate, that are extended at life. And here you can see the result of uh, part of the results of the study. If you look at the average of the terminal of life of these two products, you have 16.1 and 16.7. But look at the range. 10 hours, 10.4 hours to 23.4 for L octate and 11 to 23.6 for the adenoate. So again, on average, they're similar, but there's a great variability between patients. So for all the concentrate that we have, we have the same problem. And here, this is exactly the same concept. The concept. This is the same, same data, the same study. The green line, green line and the blue line are the two products. And you see that on average, they're basically the same. The, uh, the curve is basically the same line. But if you look at the individual data point here, look how, how they are spread in a, a very wide interval. So basically it's impossible to predict an individual requirement for, each, or for a specific patient based only on the average of the pharmacokinetic of any of the product that we have. Two main points, the larger source of variability is among the patients, not the concentrates, and the relationship between the terminal of life and time to a critical concentration is not linear. So you cannot just take you know, uh, a pen and a paper and draw a line and one measurement and draw a line. So you need a tool to, that can help you in calculate uh, how the, this curve is going and where it is going. So there are different possible ways to understand how the uh, factor eight is uh, cleared from the body of each individual patient. For example, this, the classic approach would have been to uh, have the patients in clinic um, after a washout, so completely remove any residual factor eight from his circulation and then take maybe 10, 11, uh, 12 uh, points. And then with all these points, you can trace a line. Of course, this is not very convenient, uh, uh, not for the patients, not for the physician or for the nurse that is doing the, the job. But now we also have another opportunity to understand what's the, the, the elimination curve of, uh, of our patient. We can uh, do uh, what, um, what is called uh, a, uh, a study based on population pharmacokinetic. And with this type of approach, we only need a few samples and the rest is calculated uh, with the data obtained from the previous uh, pharmacokinetics, the individual characteristic uh, of the patient uh, and taking into account a random error. So it only takes a two or three samples and uh, no washout is necessary in this case. And the patient can take his usual prophylaxis uh, before coming to clinic. Wopsam Emo, if, of course, is the, um, is the software that can uh, do uh, this calculation uh, for us. It's one of the software that can do that for us. And it's the one that we're using uh, in, um, at McMaster and it's quite used uh, in Canada and uh, all over the world. Um, so what are the advantages of this approach? You can have a precise characterization of the pharmacokinetic characteristic of any factor concentrate. You have a simplified individual pharmacokinetic profiling and you can have individualized dosing. And now also several uh, guidelines I recommend to do, uh, actually to use a, a, a population PK approach. Just to show you what uh, a pharmacokinetic curve uh, is and a few concepts uh, to keep in mind. This is after one infusion of factor, you can see that concentration rise, reaches a peak, and then slowly goes down uh, to a trough level down here. So you can have a peak level that can be important with major hemostatic challenges and that you want to keep high, especially when you have trauma, surgery, or some very heavy uh, physical activities. You can calculate an area under the curve, that is this area here, 
which has been associated with the protection against both joint and non-joint bleeding. And then you have the trough levels that is likely important and linked to the prevention of spontaneous uh, breakthrough bleeds. Now, how can I estimate uh, the PK profile with just a few samples? Because the, there are many curves that can be uh, drawn uh, through a few uh, um, samples, measurements. So we need to take uh, into account the between subject variability, some cover, uh, covariates, for example, the age, uh, the weight, the level of virulent factor, and then the random error. So if I have a specific patient, I can trace a line that is based on the population average, which could be this one. But then I can take into account his specific individual characteristics, so the covariates, and I can trace another line. But I can also measure a couple of time points, and the calculator will estimate for me the entire curve. And this is what is called the Bayesian forecasting that is uh, behind uh, WAPS HEMO. So what do we do in clinic? Well, we usually what we uh, uh, try to do is this is the this is the this rectangular shape is uh, a visit in our clinic. Let's say uh, of about three hours, uh, the patient can uh, have a blood sample collected before the infusion, then the infusion of the factor, a peak at about two to three hours, and this could be enough, if possible, and you live around a hemophilia clinic not too far, you can come back at 24 hours and take a late time point, for example, but we can also use the information of the previous infusion, what time and what dose, to uh, calc to use it in, uh, in place of the late uh, measurement. So actually you can only take two, uh, two blood samples. And with this, we can have this type of results. So we can have uh, an estimated uh, calculated curve. And you, we can see how the factor eight is uh, entered and it's disposed of uh, the body of uh, the specific patient. With this in mind, we can also have uh, with the Wapsimo software, with this, with uh, uh, under a specific regimen, we can uh, we can have the information on the time spent above one percent. What is the time spent above 3%? And for example, what is the time spent above 15%? So we can have a better understanding of what's the protection that is given to that specific patient with this specific regimen. And also we can uh, try to optimize the, um, the regimen and calculate what would happen if we change the dose or the frequency. In this example, going from 3,000 every three days, 4,000 every three days, or 2,000 every two days. Then a link to the software, maybe many of you know that there's an application for your telephone, it's called MyWAPS, and uh, it's linked to the WAPS HEMO database, and with the same information, can be downloaded on a cell phone, and it gives you the information about your factor level based on what is uh, your regimen and also can tell you what will be the factor level at a specific time point. Also, you can set up notification and you can know what uh, what is your factor level at a specific time point. If you're just re reading a book, 2% of factor is uh, fine, but maybe you want to go uh, play football or you have a kickboxing match, so 3% would not be enough for those activities. Does it work? So in general, uh, there are benefits to uh, pharmacokinetic tailored um, prophylaxis in hemophilia. And some of them have been reported. There's an increasing amount of literature uh, uh, that uh, tells us about the, the benefit of uh, the PK uh, tailored uh, dosing in hemophilia. Uh, beyond the costs that, that can be reduced, there's also uh, a reduction in uh, bleedings in some studies and a tendency towards the improvement of the uh, analyzed bleeding rate. This is one of the study that I was citing before, and I just want to show you here in this uh, first panel on your left, you see patients that uh, were before and after the tailoring that were on, on prophylaxis and uh, on demand. 
before the tailoring. This is in green, you can see the time spent about 15%. In orange, the time spent between 3 and 15 and in red, the time spent below 3%. And that, as you can see, the patients that were um, then tailored spent much less time uh, below 3% compared to the period before. Of course, the, the patients that were on demand had a more drastic change, but this is because they were uh, on demand before the tailoring. Also, the other thing I wanted to uh, highlight is that there was an increase in the uh, perceived quality of life in the patients that uh, were uh, tailored with the pharmacokinetic uh, approach. So here are some of uh, the attempts to uh, have uh, um, PK-guided um, tailoring uh, in hemophilia A. And as you can see, can be done basically with, uh, any, uh, with any product, uh, whether it's uh, standard half-life or extended half-life. And these are completely different study in different population, but you can see that both with standard half-life product and extended half-life product, you can reach uh, uh, quite um, good results in terms of percentage of patients that are completely uh, bleed free. So this is uh, a very good example that any product can be optimized using um, uh, PK uh, tailoring. This table tells you basically the same story, but I wanted uh, to focus on the median ABR here. If you, these are all many different factory products, and again, they, these are mixed, both extended half-life and uh, standard half-life. If you look at the median ABR in these studies, where there was an attempt to tailor the prophylaxis, you can see that several of them could achieve zero median ABR, and the others are pretty low anyway. So uh, again, the tailoring, the personalized prophylaxis with factory concentrate can be very successful. And in the end, uh, I just want to highlight that we need and we want to do patient-centered care because we want to understand what are the patient goals and values. We want to give and provide up-to-date medical information we want that the patient can uh, understand risks and benefits and what are the alternative op options. But the, it's extremely important that uh, all of our patients are engaged in the discussion and that we can understand what are the goals for, uh, their, for their life because in the end we can provide guidance. But um, the most important part of our work is to empower the patients with the knowledge to make their own decision for their own life and to live the life that they really want to, to live. Uh, and of course, uh, having a pharmacokinetic, pharmacokinetic based approach uh, gives us the, the opportunity to give you the information needed to manage your, your own life. So just to conclude, uh, I want to say that every patient is uh, different and in hemophilia, one size fits all does not uh, work. Uh, since uh, the bleeding episode can occur in many different circumstances, uh, the personal prophylaxis should and can target the full factor eight PK curve in order to optimize the, the prevention uh, of the bleedings. The PK guided prophylaxis can be supported by technology that now makes it easy to use and uh, easy to understand. And there are real world evidence that uh, PK guided prophylaxis is actually improving uh, the outcomes, the cost and the quality of life of, of our patients. And uh, this is my last slide. Thank you all. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Mattino. That was very informative. As I said to everybody, there was a lot of information in that presentation. Um, it will be available, as I said, on our website and social media channels probably next week. So if you want to go to it and look at it in more detail, it'll be there. Um, and I'll just wait for any to see if I've got any questions to put forward.
Ibrahim, so we have one question so far. Okay. So I got it. So Dr. Matino, the question is, <clears throat> our grandson was born with severe hemophilia A. He'll be four months old, May 29th. Will a PK study be possible when he turns six months and starts treatment? So, all right, so first, um, well, I'll, I'll start answering if it's possible or not. Uh, it is possible. Uh, almost everything is possible. Uh, then the sec, but the second part is: is it uh, needed, and is it the right time? Um, so, it being possible, yes, it is. I mean, as I showed you, uh, you can uh, do it with basically uh, two samples. So it's not, or three samples. It's not impossible to do that, even if it's very young boy. Um, but uh, at that age you have to balance um, the need for doing or, or uh, uh, PK and if you're really going to use it. Because at that young age, um, you don't have a lot of um, variability in what's your physical activity. Um, you will probably have a type of prophylaxis that is um, also uh, taking into account the venous axis and the feasibility of doing the venipuncture, unless there's a peak line, for example. And also at that age, the uh, the baby uh, will uh, grow very quickly. And with him, his uh, pharmacokinetic will change. So it's, it's not impossible, but in this specific context, I would wonder if it's really um, useful from a pragmatic point of view to do that. Uh, it's very useful to do a PK in the vast majority of the patients, especially when they are, I, I usually see adult patients. So after they're a 18 at least. Uh, and I would say that basically all of our hemophilia A patients are asked to have a PK profile. And we try to explain as much as we can why it's useful and what, as I just did, and what do we do with that information. But uh, at that specific age, maybe um, it's not as um, um, as uh, needed and as in, as important as in, a, in an older stage of life. I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> okay, Dr. Martino, we have one more, and that is: uh, Would this process work with hemophilia, uh, hemophilia B? factor nine as well in, in any way? So the short answer is uh, yes, you can do the same um, uh, the same thing with uh, hemophilia B and factor nine products. However, the interpretation of the PK curve and the, the different product with, with you can obtain that pharmacokinetic profile is slightly different and more complicated. So with hemophilia A is more immediate and I could explain it quite easily, I hope. Uh, but with hemophilia B, we should do a different uh, type of reasoning and there are a few more details to take into account. But in general, uh, you can obtain a similar PK profile with the different factor nine products, even though they will be completely different because what has complicated things uh, compared to hemophilia A is that, that with hemophilia B products, we have extended half-life products, engineered products that not only change the half-life of the factor nine concentrate, but also other PK um, aspects such as the volume of distribution. So it's a, a it's a more complex type of analysis. Thank you. Okay, so I don't see any more questions. So it looks like we may be able to get you all back out into the heat sooner than, uh, than we thought. Um, oh, wait a sec, we may have something coming up. Yes, we do have another one.
Okay, Dr. Martino, do you have another one? Does the half-life curve change with physical activity? So for example, you have a treatment, then go kickboxing mm -hmm. later that day. So um, the physical activity can um, make some modification in the amount and composition of our blood compartment. But if, you know, behind the question is, can I trust my PK profile that I see on my WAPs, for example, uh, when I have to do physical activity? Their answer is yes. There will be some, probably some um, minor differences, but yes, if you see that, for example, your PK modeling show that after your 3000 infusion, you have a peak of say 80% and you want to go kickboxing, then you can do that. And if your MyWAPs after one hour show you that you have 70%, it can be 73 or it can be 65, but doesn't really uh, change in a significant way, does not impact in a significant way your uh, clearance, your elimination curve of the factor. So you can do your physical activity and you can trust that your factor eight is protecting you if you've received your infusion. Great, thank you. All right. So I think um, that looks like it's it for questions. Uh, we do actually have one compliment already for you. Dr. Matino's response to our question was very informative. He answered it very well. Thank you. So, so there we go. <laughs> Thank, you. Um, Thank you very much. I mean, if you go away and digest this presentation and you do come up with questions, you can just send an email to info at hemophiliaontario.on.ca and we'll do our best to get the answer and get it to you. Um, and like I say, the entire presentation, you'll be able to take in at your leisure probably middle of next week. So having said that, I really would like to thank Dr. Martino for his time uh, and coming out and presenting to us all. Um, I'd like to thank Okta Pharma uh, for their involvement and in, in collaboration with us in making this happen. And as I said at the beginning of the presentation, we've got a number of these coming down the road over the next month or so. So. Um, uh, hopefully, we look forward to seeing you all there. And I don't know if Okta Pharma, if Lydia or anybody wants to say anything other than that, then I will let you guys go and conclude today's presentation. Byron, uh, there are just three more questions that came up uh, towards the end there. If you can't see them, I, I'm happy to read them out loud if we've got time. Yeah, yeah do you want to do that? Thank you. Sure. Um, so, Dr. Matino, one question is, what time points do you recommend for PK analysis? So, I guess this is what time points to be taken as a measurement. So, we usually recommend, well, again, it's a trade-off between what is possible and uh, what is ideal. Um, in general, what we ask is to have a pre, so before the infusion of factor eight. Uh, a peak about three hours after that, and if possible, 24 hours. We're talking about factor eight, so 24 hours after uh, the first one. This is what we suggest. A fourth one, it would be, sure, you can do that. It's increased a little bit the precision, but it's not really needed. Okay, excellent. And there were two more. So, um, does half life change as you age? Sorry? Does half-life change as you age? With age? Yeah. Um, so um, in for what I know, there's no study that has specifically show that half-life can change with age. It might be that in some people with age, the level of von Willebrand factor could increase. We can see that sometimes and this would affect the uh, half-life of the infused factor eight, because there's uh, uh, an association between the amount of von Willebrand factor circulating and the half-life of the product that we infuse, because the von Willebrand factor will 
uh, basically transport factor VIII and will prevent, at least in part, the degradation. So it might be that would slightly increase in some patients over time uh, as the level of vampiran factor increases. Okay, excellent. And then the last question is, that I see here was, can you use CBDR and PKWAP together? Sorry, say it again. Can you use CBDR and uh, PKWAP together? Um, sure. <laughs> That's what we hope for. <laughs> I mean, to use uh, CBDR, to use uh, WAPSIMO and my WAPS uh, and have uh, all the information um, together to provide the best care possible because you can, you know, have uh, your registry where you note your bleeding, your you know, infusion, and you have your PK that's linked and we can compare when you bleed and how, for how frequently with uh, your PK profile. So definitely we, you can use all these tools together as actually we definitely encourage that. We hope that all the patients can do that in Canada. I have another one, Dr. Matino, and it's um, what time points do you recommend for PK analysis? Um, yes, this is probably similar to the other one. Uh, as I said, um, you can do, for if you were talking about the POP PK that we are doing at McMaster and that it's uh, analyzed through WAPSIMO, you can, uh, what we recommend is having a baseline, so before the infusion, you can do that the day that you come to the clinic, you take the first measurement before factor into infusion, you get the infusion in the clinic, you wait about three hours, we take another measurement, and then ideally, if you can, you come back to the clinic in 24 hours. And this would be plenty of data to calculate the PK profile. And I don't, I thought I seen one more. I don't know if we took this one or not, but I'll ask it again, Dr. Matino. Does mm -hmm. having, sure. <clears throat> excuse me, a history of inhibitor mm -hmm. affect um, the half life? Sorry, having a, a history of inhibitor? Yep. Does it what? affect half life? Yes. So, uh, well, it can it can affect the half life. So um, even though after ITI the inhibitor can be eradicated clinically, I mean you don't see any more uh, spontaneous bleeding, and if you measure it in the lab, you say you see it's zero. You don't see any neutralizing activity. Um, even uh, if that happens, your half-life can be shorter than normal because you might still have antibodies that binds to factor VIII, even though in vitro, they do not neutralize the activity of factor VIII. So they are bound to the molecule. They are, let the molecule of factor VIII do its own work, but it decreases the half-life of uh, the infused factor. So yes, it can happen that the half-life that uh, in specific patients that have had inhibitor before is still shorter compared to patients that never had an inhibitor. Yes, it does affect the half-life in, in some cases, yeah. Okay, uh, we have another one. <clears throat> Are there any studies um, that focus on percentage for trough and pain management. Um, and the example he, the questionnaire was using is, anecdotally, I know that if I drop below 12%, I struggle with chronic pain more. Hmm. Uh, uh, no, not really. Um, but um, there's, you know, uh, blood in the joint, for example, is very painful as, many of you uh, may have seen or know. Um, so even micro uh, amount, very small, tiny amount of blood uh, in the joints can be painful, can uh, make you feel some 
of your joints aching. So, and these microbleeds might occur even with um, some uh, factor levels still circulating. Of course, if you have more than 10, 15, 20% of residual factor eight, this is extremely unlikely. So it's possible that microbleeds that we cannot see clinically because the range of motion is still there, is okay. We cannot see it with an ultrasound, uh, but there still is some tiny amount of blood in the joint. And this might be possible for some patients and for the lower levels of factor eight. So I'm not aware of any study that specifically addressed the level of pain and compared to the baseline, the trough, um, the trough factor level uh, in any study that I know, but uh, it could be, it could be that uh, patients that have a higher trough level can um, have less frequently a microbleed and then have less pain compared to when they were having a uh, um, trough levels lower than that. So it could be, it could be, but I don't think there's any robust evidence to, to say that. Of course, you know, everybody would like to, for all the patients to have a trough of, I don't know, 20%, 30%, not having uh, ever uh, less than, I don't know, 5% or 10%. It's just that it's really difficult to achieve right now. Thank you. Okay, any, unless you see anything that I don't see, I believe that's it for our questions. All right. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Martino, for your time. Thanks to all our attendees for joining. We hope to see you at some of our future sessions. And again, sound like a broken record, but <laughs> session is recorded <laughs> and you'll be able to access it through Hemophilia Ontario probably middle of next week. So thank you all. Enjoy your, your very warm evening and we hope to see you in the future. Thank you. Thank you for having Thanks. me. Thank you. Bye. Bye.